How did I get to do what I'm doing now? Well, right now I'm the editor-in-chief of Minnesota Business Magazine, a production of uh, Tiger Oak Productions in Minneapolis. And uh, I've been working in media for about 30 years, and I started as a uh, philosophy major, got a BA, and went to graduate school in philosophy at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I was sitting in the uh, TA offices one evening, and I thought, you know, if anyone ever did get a good idea here, who would ever hear about it? Because the philosophers tend to talk in a certain language amongst themselves, and, and it's hard for a person off the street to, to read or understand what they're up to. So then one Sunday morning in Seattle, I was listening to a community public radio station, KRAB, and there was a fellow playing old jazz records and reading bad poetry, and I thought, I could do that. And so when I went to back to Minneapolis, I never finished uh, graduate school there, I never finished my master's, and it's still hanging over my head. But uh, I kept thinking philosophically until today, and I'll keep doing that. But for a livelihood, I, uh, or, or actually for an interest, I became involved in a parallel radio station in Minneapolis called KFAI, which is Community Public Radio. You can go and do your own show. So that's where I learned media. And one of my things that plagued me in graduate school was a writer's block, especially in philosophy. I had a, a class on split brain studies and philosophical psychology, and they said, well, you have, uh, does it have one mind or two minds? I said, well, what's a mind? You know, we've got to figure that out first, don't we? And they said, well, they talked about awareness and consciousness. I said, well, what's, what's consciousness? And so I, there was always seemed to be a, another problem uh, behind the, the problem that faced you to try to figure out. So I, I never found any resolution. I had a lot of uh, incompletes at, uh, in Seattle. And so uh, when I first volunteered for KFAI, they said, well, the best way to learn about radio is to volunteer for the news program. So I walked in one day and they gave me the uh, Minneapolis Star, the afternoon paper, and said, well, here, here's the story on Dutch Elm disease. Uh, why don't you write that up into a little radio story or a uh, news story for our uh, six o'clock program? Well, this is like a two in the afternoon, and, and uh, well, how can you do that? There's so much here. How can, it's just that they have these university studies. There's all this derivation of these efforts to try to fight Dutch Elm disease. You know, I, I didn't think it could be done. But because of that deadline, there's no deadline like a broadcast deadline. And so I worked on it and finally got the little story written down and, you know, to like a big, long paragraph, probably with very long sentences and using a lot of big words. But... Uh, and then I was done and I handed it to the news director and he says, well, it's time to go on the air. Why don't you go on the air and read it? So then I, that was my first time on, on radio. And then I became kind of hooked. So I did different programs on KFAI for like a dozen years and also um, started getting paid at different places. That was all volunteers. So I started getting paid. Uh, uh, my first paid broadcast was with K-Twin which used to be 108 here in the Twin Cities, and then uh, Jack Moore sold it and set up a cable operation. So I became a, a, a cable radio disc jockey, and then he started doing overnight, or he started doing a, a, a video, uh, video programs. This was about the era in the early 80s when MTV was coming along. So he did jazz videos, a lot of which they made themselves with local talent. So I was a video jockey in the early 80s, and went on from there to being a video producer and uh, uh, learned how to do television by becoming a, a going to cable access and just learning by doing. That's been the main thing that I've <laughs> uh, picked up as far as applying philosophy is I've become a pragmatist by learning by doing. I just dive into things. Um, the first paid job I had after philosophy though was was uh, um, also noteworthy in that I was studying Asian philosophy, uh, Sanskrit, mysticism. I was doing things like that, and that's probably one reason I didn't get too far in the, in the field. But I went from there to working as a behavior modification specialist at a, at a, at a, uh, a home for uh, mentally handicapped adults. And so I went from being a mystic to a behaviorist, and then philosophy helped there too, because you had all these people that were basically in their own little worlds, and the way I maneuvered that was by using a phenomenological technique, I would just not question the reality of whatever they were talking about and just try to communicate with them on their own terms. This turned out to be very successful and so my clients progressed very rapidly up the behavior modification scale because I was able to communicate effectively with them. 
So I'm always applying philosophy to my, my different uh, tasks in life. Um, probably the first major uh, uh, news organization I worked for was KSTP Radio. I was in their newsroom uh, rewriting everything for radio. And then I, I found that philosophy helped me to edit down because they had these big long stories that would come in from the Associated Press and the radio stories like three sentences. And so the idea of condensing things is very much a part of what you do in philosophy. You don't want to... Um, in, uh, I'm, I'm told that in English classes you're told to elaborate, but in philosophy you're told to condense, and that fit in perfectly with what I was doing. So I would started looking at the conceptual uh, ideas beneath what uh, the story was, and it was easier then to see which part was fluff and which part was redundant and which part was, was the core that needed to be kept. Uh, I went from KSDP to KFAN Radio, I went to uh, um, got a job in uh, cable television. Uh, then I worked for Jesse Ventura, uh, talk about <laughs> philosophy. Uh, worked in his cabinet uh, as a, uh, uh, in the communications office as a speechwriter for him and for Lieutenant Governor May Shunk. From there, I went and started working in print with the Business Journal, which is a weekly newspaper featuring business news. I was managing editor there. From there, I went to the Star Tribune to edit a magazine uh, an, uh, an upscale lifestyle magazine called Mark Magazine. And uh, from there, uh, there I was a victim of the recession. They killed that magazine just uh, before they declared bankruptcy at the Star Tribune. And uh, two weeks after, we'd won six awards of excellence. So then I became a ghostwriter for about six years. And my designer for some of the books that I would, would be writing uh, worked at the Minnesota Business Magazine. And so then he called one day and said, hey, our editor's quitting. Can you fill in? And uh, I said, sure, and then they hired me. So that's, that's how I got to where I am today. And what have you learned? What have I learned? I've learned, uh, I've learned a quite a bit because I've probably interviewed uh, thousands of people along my way. A lot of them interviewed live on the radio, uh, a lot of them uh, pre-recorded interviews. And I found that um, I can learn a lot talking with people uh, more so than I can reading books. I mean, I still continue to read books, mainly nonfiction, pursuing my uh, different philosophical interests, but I found that I can learn a lot from people, and I've learned about the importance of communication, and, and it makes me worry a little bit about the hyper-mediated realities we have today with all the Facebook and the texting and everything. That, so face-to-face so -face human communication has become uh, a priority to me. Well, we have more touching points than could be easily enumerated. Okay. One of the first teachers I worked with in St. Paul schools was May Shunk. Ah. So I intersected briefly. The Ventura administration mm. was taken to task for having put a critic of that administration's emphasis on the air early in his in the career, someone who ventured to give advice. And to, so anyhow, I've, we've, we've had a lot of things in common for okay. all, above all, uh, an interest in face-to-face -face communication mm -hmm. as a mode. Um, but you were starting back, when you were studying philosophy, it was with this Eastern philosophy emphasis, this mystical, mystical emphasis. Can you say anything about where that came from? Sure. Uh, sure. I graduated from high school in the seven, uh, 1970, which means that I'm kind of a product of the 60s. And um, I came from a very disciplined, organized background in that I grew up on a military base. And everything was very clear and ordered and very hierarchical. You had God was up here, then you had President Eisenhower, then you had the Marine Corps Commandant, then you had the Base Commandant, and then it filtered down and even all the fathers had their ranks on, your, on a little plaque on their license, uh, on, the, on the bumpers of their car. So everything was very ordered, um, they all wore uniforms, we were very highly disciplined in school. Then off the base these civilians were, you know, they were just really disorganized and crazy. Uh, we had, uh, we were very polite and disciplined on the base. Off the base, especially off Camp Lejeune in North Carolina in the 1960s, you still had segregated bathrooms, things like that. So, um, 
there's just something wrong with these civilians. And then uh, uh, in 1965, I moved off the base, came up to Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, where my mother moved us to be close to the University of Minnesota, by the way. And, uh, and then, of course, that was about the time that all uh, hell was breaking loose uh, socially. You had the, the hippies, you had the Beatles, you had the anti-Vietnam War protests, you had race riots. And uh, my question was, why is everybody so crazy? And that was my driving idea. So, uh, and, and along, those, those, along that time, there was also a big uh, introduction of Indian philosophy through all the, uh, the Swamis coming to the West and, and preaching, you know, Maharashi, Mahesh Yogi, and others. And so uh, my group of friends became interested in that literature, and so I, I dove into it, and, uh, and for a while believed it. For like 30 days, I was a total naive Hindu and became a vegetarian and everything. Um, and then uh, I went to school, actually I transferred to the uh, College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and my friend was taking a philosophy course here at the U, and so I decided to do the same, and what was open was existentialism. And I was surprised that a lot of the questions they were asking seemed to be the same sorts of questions that the Hindus and Buddhists were asking. You know, what is God? What is existence? You know, is this all real? And so I became intrigued by that. And I became a philosophy major. I had been a history major, but I, I switched to philosophy then. And what became my driving question was, uh, would, would be the topics that are, are grouped together in what is called philosophy of mind. So it became my goal to try to figure out uh, why is there such a gap between East and West? Why do Western philosophers think that Eastern philosophers have no content? And so I began to study philosophy of mind. What is the, the, the different concepts of consciousness in Indian philosophy and the concepts of consciousness in, in Western philosophy and intentionality and all that sort of thing? And so um, that became my driving focus. So it wasn't so much mysticism. Mysticism for me was a subset of philosophy of mind. And, I mean, I, I, what made you give it up exactly? Well, I didn't give it up. Uh, they gave me up. We had uh, three tests. We had three papers to submit to get into the PhD program at the University of Washington. And one of mine was a, um, was a paper, this almost sounds like a joke. Uh, we had three papers and, and one of them, we had uh, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson came and taught a class in mysticism, and I'd gotten an A+. Plus. So I thought, well, I'd better submit this paper. And I took out a section because I thought maybe it should be shorter. Mm -hmm. And it was graded by three professors. One, a specialist in Indian philosophy. One, a, uh, uh, a Norwegian existentialist. And one, uh, uh, an analytic philosopher from Texas. Well, the, the Indian philosopher says, well, this is breakthrough stuff. In fact, I applied some of the ideas from uh, University of Minnesota's Keith Gunderson. Uh, I had him in philosophy of mind, and he talked about programmable, resistant, and programmable, receptive features of mind. And so I, I, I combined that to analyze a, a certain kind of mystical individual in India, which is enlightened but yet alive, the Jivan Mukti. So, uh, and, and, it, and it was kind of a person who who, who is became so habitual of a thinker and improviser in life that he did everything fluently and accurately. It's like the perfect jazz man going through life. Um, so anyway, this, this Indian philosopher said, well, this is breakthrough stuff, you know, applying Western ideas to these Eastern concepts. So out of 10, he gave me a nine. And then the, the Norwegian existentialist, he says, well, you know, this is very interesting, but there's something missing here. And so he's right. I, I should have left in the part that I took out. He spotted that gap, and so he gave me like a five. And then the, uh, the, the Texan analytic philosopher said, well, there's no philosophical content here at all, and he gave it like a two. So that, that was really the, 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 uh, the stake that they drove through my heart to, to keep me out of advancing further in philosophy. And my big weakness really was probably two things. One, I didn't know enough about analytic philosophy to be able to to move through. And, and then I really didn't understand much about anything. I mean, I, I really uh, didn't know enough to continue. So to one extent, uh, to a certain extent, they were correct, but, but really it's been hanging over me all my life. And, and I've, never, I, I've never given up studying philosophy. I'm still going through. I'm still taking classes and reading books. 
our, our, our histories are astonishingly parallel. Uh, I finished 26 years after I started oh, with a... There's hope. Yeah, there is hope. It perhaps has not been quite so long mm -hmm. for you. Uh, and uh, it's an astonishingly parallel story. Another aspect that's parallel is that uh, the site is that when I turned from projects in which I experienced writer's block, the the cure seemed to be journalism or something like journalism, I, and I, so I'm very struck by that decision. But I'm also just curious whether anything of that previous philosopher identity carried over I into, still, your, in, into the project you mm -hmm. took on next and the way you understood what you were doing when you took on these, this incredible range of projects. Well, I still uh, self-identify as philosopher, and I try to sneak that into whatever I'm doing. Uh, for example, we recently had a uh, an issue focusing on the the best places to work, the 100 best companies to work for in the Twin Cities. And so um, I looked at the different things they were doing and it kind of fit into the different uh, uh, species of happiness between uh, uh, Aristotle's concept of happiness versus Epicurus's. And so I, I put that in my little writer's, uh, editor's introduction, uh, comparing it like that. Um, then I interviewed uh, for another issue, uh, another philosophy major, Dessa, Dessa Darling, and uh, we had a pretty philosophical talk. She talked about uh, the, the, the ethics of being beautiful and performing on stage and the ethics of uh, using a, a different um, uh, 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 musical form that was African-American. How can a middle-class white woman walk in and do... So um, anyway, I, 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 I really don't separate my philosophy from what I do. I, I should mention, too, that I um, combined the two. I did, I did have that that lack of not finishing my master's. So I came back here to the university and uh, in the late 90s and got a master's degree in journalism focusing on media ethics. And Doug Lewis, who was longtime chair of the uh, Minnesota's department, he was on my uh, committee. So uh, even there, I tied it all in. So how have you come to understand what you do as an interviewer? <laughs> as an interviewer? Well, I, I, I think my little talk about phenomenology still holds true. I don't attack the person's reality. I let the reality exist and then I probe into it. So my goal as an interviewer is not to extract information, but rather to gain understanding of their perspective. And uh, that builds up trust. And what happens is that the people open up more and more the more I do that. And my favorite comments from the radio, whether it was live or pre-recorded, is I didn't mean to say that, and I forgot we were on the radio. So that, that then you know you're doing a good job as an interviewer if you can get people to open up and, and forget where they are. Like when I when I did radio, we would I would turn down turn off the fluorescent lights and get a couple lamps and then have a cup of coffee. I wouldn't wear the headphones because that's kind of alienating. And then we would drink coffee and just chat and. I specialized in a program called Java Jive where we had like three guests or four guests at one time and we just have kind of a general conversation. So uh, my technique was uh, also uh, informality as well as um, accepting, <laughs> accepting um, their reality. That doesn't mean I wouldn't probe around and, 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 and uh, uh, explore their ideas, but uh, anyway, that's what worked for me. And how did you understand what an interview of the kind you like to do did for the, the listener or the viewer? The, um, <clears throat> well, a couple things. One, I, happened, I had the advantage of having a mentor. This was an old fellow I met up for a while at, at KFAI. I was doing radio drama, and this fellow was much older than me, and he moved in from uh, New York and uh, just gotten divorced and came in and found work as a, uh, a voice talent. And he had been in radio, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, and done television when it just started in the 60s, and then went into theater. So he, he would take me around and we'd do interviews, man on the street interviews. 
and uh, he kind of showed me the technique of what you're looking for. And the basic thing that has driven all my media work is that I'm the first audience. You know, I, I look for what's interesting, and if it's interesting to me, I, I'm just gambling that'll be interesting to the, to the, uh, to the audience. So that's what I've done. And uh, in radio, the best thing I learned was um, you always imagine there's an individual listening. People don't listen in a group. The early radio announcers would, you know, talk loud and broadcast like they were trying to reach a thousand people at once, but it's usually just one person there. So if you talk on that personal conversational level, uh, that's what's key. It's, um, and then just go for what's, what's interesting. And then, you know, it's like they say, if you can fake sincerity, then you've got it made. But uh, usually I'm actually interested. I'm a curious type person. So I'm, I'm usually interested in, in what people are saying. And I think that authenticity carries across. So you've worked in radio, you've worked in television, you've worked in print. Uh, have you thought much about the difference in these modes? Well, uh, in what respect? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One, how it works as an, as an encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, what happens with it as you take it out to the community? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I confess I'm in a sort of weird position because people don't have to like my stuff. Uh, you know, I don't get paid, so I don't get paid any more if they think it's wonderful than if they turn it off after five minutes. So I can kind of be the audience. And that's a, an enormous privilege. But then it also means that I can think a little bit about, well, what's good for these people? Even if they like that sugary cereal and the little marshmallow hearts and such, maybe it's good for them to hear something a little different, and I can think that way. Well, so I guess I'm, I'm curious about how you think about these different media. I almost did radio, but there were problems. Uh, I've, I've never actually tried to print an interview. It seems like a weird thing. Uh, there's something about video that I particularly like, and I'm wondering if you have similar kinds of ranges of preferences and opinions and thoughts about the different modalities. Well, uh, my favorite medium is radio, because um, it's easier. I mean, you're here with carrying all this equipment yourself. Imagine if you just carried a microphone and a little recorder. It's a lot easier. So, uh, when I started in video, it was very difficult to do something by yourself. So there's, there's an ease of doing radio. Plus, uh, people are more relaxed when you interview them in radio. I mean, I'm, I've, I've done television so I can you know, look into the lens and have these lights around, but a lot of people are a little bit inhibited by the lights or by the camera. And as I say, I could kind of uh, distract them from, from even thinking about the microphone, forgetting that they were on the air uh, on radio just by manipulating the lights and just my demeanor. But it's very hard to have someone forget they're on television when the lights are there. And I've been on occasions where people froze on the air, and you're trying to trying to get information out of them, and they just kind of you know stare at the you know. Then you're not supposed to stare at the lens; you're supposed to stare at the uh, the the interviewer. Um, so I I prefer radio, and then print is just so artificial and difficult, and yet at the same time flexible. Because when you transcribe an interview, um, there, there's a big difference between orality and print. People spoke for probably a couple hundred thousand years, but they've only been writing for the last five. Kids can speak naturally, but they have to be taught how to read and write. It's, it's a skill to be learned. It's, it's artificial. It's, it's a convention. So I think there's something primal about talking that when you get it into print, it loses some of that. Think of all the politicians that might tell a silly joke, and in the context, it's it's nothing. But if you see it in print, it looks terrible, and then then they're castigated because you know you, you lose you, you don't have the sense of how they were looking. You don't have the twinkle in their eye. You don't have the tone of their voice. You don't have the inflections of the words. You just have this dry print. So print is is more abstract and uh, uh, distorted 
than speech. Um, but at the same time, it's so flexible. I mean, if you're recording someone on radio or video, that's it. I mean, I've had occasions where we were doing video productions and you come back and you don't have the shot and you're stuck. But in print, oh, you can always write stuff, you can edit, you can move it around. And it's, it's more difficult to do all that, but at the same time, because in radio, once you're there, you're done unless you do some editing there. But uh, uh, in print, uh, you get to massage it, you get to squeeze it down, you know, to whatever fits. But it's, it's, it's time consuming. So um, uh, I think all three media are effective in their own way. I would prefer radio. Um, and then, but I've been doing print for the last, uh, gosh, 10, 12 years. And what's your estimate of the content loss between video and, between video and radio? The content loss between video and radio, um, it depends on the content. I mean, I remember uh, what happens in video is that the image tends to overwhelm the content. And the, the surest way for a news director to say no is if the proposed story involves a talking head. Whereas on radio, you want a talking head. So in, in, in radio, uh, the ideas get to come through, and they call that the medium of the mind, or, or the, the theater of the mind, where, where you can just imagine what's going on. And, um, but in television, uh, you know, you look at the appearance of a person, you look at the lights, you know, maybe there's a bad camera, the camera's out of focus. There's so much to distract you in video that it's not always effective. It's effective for other things. For If you're going to talk and get ideas out of a person, I don't think video is the best way to do it. Video is a good way to show there's, there's a fire in the garage. Yeah. Now, thinking of one person you've worked with, with Jesse Ventura, mm -hmm. uh, would you say that about about stuff about him? That uh, I mean, is is it are, is the content with with someone like that? Is the content going to come through better in audio? Well, you know that reminds me of the uh, the analysis of the uh, Kennedy Nixon debates. Uh, they said that Kennedy won on television, but on radio they said Nixon won. So there's a there's a difference because um, you know Nixon, you know, he had like a five o'clock shadow. He didn't shave, and you know, you just look at him. He looks <laughs> looks a little sneaky, a little beady, little eyes. You know, so those those superficial things that you might judge a person on uh, disappeared on the radio. Uh, for someone like Jesse, Jesse is a persona. So part of his charisma is his looks, you know, the bald head, the mustache, the swagger, you know, the head moving around, the, you know, he's big. Um, so uh, I, I would depend on what the message is. But I remember from the Reagan years, there was a, uh, uh, a news story that was very negative about Reagan. And they showed him at some news event, you know, riding a horse or whatever. And his, Reagan's PR people, uh, thought it was wonderful. And I said, why, why did you like that? Nobody listens to the words, they just look at the pictures. So I think words and ideas lose out on television. Very interesting. Um, now, as I was kind of tracking the list of things you've done, you know, there's a bunch of stuff early on that amounts to representing other people's content. <laughs> Boiling down articles that somebody oh, hands in, in you, or, or or with you know presumably in in Ventura's administration, mm -hmm. uh, being a kind of spokesperson or sure. uh, packager in some sense mm -hmm. for programs and people and so forth, uh, and then someplace in there there's this master's degree in media ethics. And now you're in a position where, presumably, you assign the stories. Right. Uh, you have a fair amount of scope about how you take things, uh, what sort of thing you write, what angle you take. And um, I'm wondering, you know, how that growth in responsibility in your own voice in the media has has happened for you? 
I'm not sure if I understand well, I mean, that. Exactly. I just mean from being the guy who is handed a bunch of stuff and mm -hmm. say, make some sense out of this mm -hmm. and get it out so it looks good. Mm -hmm. To the guy who hands people stuff and oh. says, you know, well, <laughs> and decides what's in that pile that gets handed mm -hmm. to him. Okay, well, let me um, think. The um, okay, there there are times when I wrote speeches where I had to convey the ideas and policies as someone else, and so what I can say about that is, first I would have to understand those people. So for Jesse Ventura and May Shunk. I had to understand their personalities and then a lot of their life stories and then the policy would come along and I'd have to understand that policy and then I would kind of jumble them all up and put them into basically a logical argument to, to, uh, to, uh, to make their point about why there's... Uh, and, and, and that's when it became so clear to me that philosophy in and of itself is, is uh, insufficient because people don't work purely on the cognitive ideas. They, they go on, on some sense of emotion. So you have to have emotional appeal uh, tied into that. I suppose that's the difference between logic and rhetoric. But so I had to have uh, stories that would uh, connect with the person. Same thing, on, uh, same thing in all the, the media that I've worked on since is that is the importance of an affective component so that you have emotional connection with the person as opposed to just giving out dry information. So the thing that spans whatever I do, uh, whether it's me getting someone across or having a, a reporter do a story on something, it's got to be interesting or no one's going to read it. And part of that interest is uh, having an emotional appeal. And part of it is having uh, clear thoughts. So in, in my uh, uh, value system for, for writing or anything else would be uh, uh, clarity and flow. And, and some sort of interest. I don't know if that answered your question, but... Well, uh, yeah. So what did you do with the Media Ethics Masters? What kind of conclusions did you come to in the course of that? Well, that's kind of interesting, too. Uh, there were two angles to that. Uh, one, my master's thesis turned into kind of a, an intellectual history of the concept of happiness. And here's a, here's a simple argument, maybe you, maybe you would enjoy it. The, uh, because the First Amendment is such a big deal in journalism. They right? talk about it all the time, and, and some people go to jail for it. It's, it's very important. And it's kind of like a, a, a god, you know. That's, that's the, the, there, there are a lot of uh, journalists that don't want to have associations with other journalists from other countries because they don't have the First Amendment. They're going to bend it. They're going to have some higher priority. Well, uh, I took the, the approach that the, uh, the First Amendment is in the Bill of Rights, and the, the first statement of human rights in the American sense was the Declaration of Independence. And basically, the Declaration of Independence is a, 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 an ethical argument. You know, we have these rights, and if a government gets in the way, then it's our duty to uh, get rid of that government. It's, and and, and the, the key thing there, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, well, uh, you can look, look at Locke talks about this uh, in his ideas, not in his uh, uh, political writings, but uh, he uses the, the, the phrase, pursuit of happiness justifies the need for liberty. So uh, life and liberty are means to achieve happiness. So that's it's kind of a teleological structure there in the Declaration of Independence. And so if you look at the freedom of the press, well, that too is also a subsidiary. It's instrumental. So that's basically what I did, is I took it back, um, analyzed what the pursuit of happiness meant to the, to the people that, that wrote about it, Jefferson and all those guys. And, and the thing is, everybody believed in it. It was just everywhere. Jefferson didn't make it up. Everybody believed in it. It's just like the uh, Aristotle said in uh, Nicomachean Ethics, all the Greeks believe that happiness is the purpose of life, but nobody agrees on what it means. Well, the same with, with the, the, the revolutionaries. They all agreed with it, but they didn't agree on what it meant. And then I trace that back to uh, Aristotle and Epicurus and how it changed over the years. And finally, it got usurped by the Christians and kicked into heaven, and then in the Enlightenment brought back down, and then quantified by uh, Bentham and Mill, and then, um, and then trivialized by peanuts. Happiness is a, 
is a warm puppy. Happiness is a warm gun. So anyway, that's, that's what I did there. Uh, and so the fun of that was that it got me exploring these philosophical ideas that had been bugging me for a long time and, and, and continue to bug me. What um, the, the most revealing uh, issue I confronted in, in terms of media ethics, uh, we studied all these ethical theories, and then there was this one uh, symposium, uh, I forget what it was, but they had all these people representing different theories make a judgment, and they all agreed. And they just had all their different theories giving different reasons to why they, they disagreed. And so uh, when it comes to the newsroom, uh, I tend to think that there's an affective component to the, the moral sense. I would go, I, I'm starting to believe in the moral sense that if something grabs you in a newsroom, that something's not right about this, should we be doing this? I think being able to key into your conscience, like Socrates did, uh, is, is the key to ethics. Because then, then you start a discussion in the newsroom, and you get all the people talking about it, and you hash it out, and then you decide what to do. When people get, when news organizations are sued for doing things, it makes a big difference if they can say, well, we went through this discussion and we decided this. Oh, okay, so at least you thought about it. You didn't do it blindly. And then another big debate was codes of ethics. And believe it or not, there's arguments against those. And the best argument against those is then you don't think. You don't have to think. Well, just follow the rules. And you, so, in general, I've become a real antagonist towards rules of ethics because uh, look at Congress. Well, I, I broke no rule. I broke no law. Yeah, but you did a terrible thing. Everybody knows it was terrible. Yes, but, but find where, where it says I did something terrible. So, anyway, I, 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 I tend to uh, go to the, the gut, the conscience, the, the feeling as the, the spark of, of what's ethical and, or unethical and, and to, to track that out and talk it out to uh, figure out your actions. Uh, when did you start with Minnesota Business? Just eight months ago. Okay. I'm new there. So, I mean, return with us for just a minute to the, to the days of yesteryear, yesteryear. to the days uh, just preceding the 2008 collapse. Okay. And I mean, there must have been a Minnesota piece to that story. There Good. must, you know, I mean, the 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 the, 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 the skull that got people put in jail and a, a couple put in jail in New York must have had a, a Minnesota counterpart in in trading and, well. and, and and such. I'm wondering. I mean, the story I get is that some exceedingly icky things were going on and every. Lots of people felt bad about it, and somehow it never raised to the. It never, you know, it wasn't getting to the level of consciousness quickly enough. Well, once again, you had people that were obeying rules or laws or, 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 or something, and I don't recall that anybody went to jail for the recession. Uh, there are people that went to jail, like Bernie Madoff, that got caught, um, you know, lying, you know, building a pyramid scheme. And here we had Tom Petters doing the same thing in the Twin Cities, so there, there's a parallel. But, but the, the recession, um, you know, back when I studied behavior, uh, uh, you know, positive reinforcement, I, I did that with, with um, uh, uh, our clients. And, you know, from studying mysticism to studying behaviorism, it's, it's like the other extreme. But what I found out is that, that behaviorism indeed works as far as positive and negative reinforcements. And it's good for child raising. I had a daughter, and I would catch my wife, you know, if, 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 the, if the child did something wrong uh, and they start crying, you don't pick them up because that's a positive reinforcement. So what we saw in the recession was that uh, Wall Street did a very bad thing, and what you did is then you gave them lots of money. <laughs> you know, that was a positive reinforcement. What are they supposed to learn from that? And so that's why, I, 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 I don't know. So... Uh, Part of my study of, of, of uh, pursuit of happiness and everything was, was becoming kind of a, a grassroots devotee, you know. So I, 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 I tend to place uh, the value of democracy with the grassroots and I distrust hierarchies. And for President Obama, for the good and bad things that he's done, uh, he's definitely part of the hierarchy and he bailed, off, he, he bailed out the, the people on top giving positive reinforcement to the people that cause all the damage. Yeah. 
you're in a funny position with a with a publication like the one you run. Which mm-hmm. is you're capable of giving meaningful positive and negative reinforcement to the particular deciders uh, in the Twin Cities context. I mean, am I right? I mean, you know, you, if you say this may not rise to the level of illegality, but it's making us in the newsroom very queasy what Target is doing in Canada right now, right. Uh, or what's happening to the, the stores that are getting squeezed out in certain kinds of corporate maneuvers. I mean, if you say that, people are going to hear about it at, the, at certain parties. It's going to be a matter. Right. Well, the uh, particular magazine I have, we have competitors, and so we have to differentiate ourselves. And we're a monthly magazine focusing on small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, Our erstwhile competitors, you have the Twin Cities Business Magazine, which is a monthly which is more newsy, more traditional, perhaps, and they cover all the businesses, you know, big and small. And then you have the Minneapolis-St. Paul Business Journal, where I formerly worked. They're a news organization looking at the facts, latest facts coming out. So we don't do news, we don't do the biggest companies. Uh, I consider ourselves more of a community magazine. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking to connect the people that we have. And in fact, built into our system, uh, nothing is a pure magazine anymore. We have our not only our online component, but also our person-to-person component in the form of uh, events throughout the year honoring best places to work. We just had leaders in healthcare, best in manufacturing. And those are a variety of positive reinforcements for people doing a good job, doing excellent work that deserve attention. So we do we hand out a lot of that. One thing that I've done since I've been there is I've been encouraging more opinion pieces, and so um, uh, and 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 not writing them myself, but having you know the insiders write them. So uh, that's the way I'm I'm getting critiques out. My job is not so much to um, to point fingers at people. Uh, uh, but to, and in our events, do the positive reinforcement. We give positive reinforcement in the sense that just to cover somebody, just to do a story on somebody is what they want. I remember uh, in the days when I did KFAI radio, I covered uh, theater and music and dance. I covered the arts. And throughout the 80s, I probably saw every play that was put on in the Twin Cities. And what, here was how the theaters felt. The best thing was a good review. The next best thing was a bad review. The worst thing was not to be reviewed at all. So basically to be in the magazine is, is in itself positive reinforcement. And they said that too, even in uh, uh, mainstream newspapers, uh, like, well, as long as they spell your name right, you're doing okay, you got publicity. Uh, and especially in our culture these days, you know, you can be a felony and then go back to your cooking show. Yeah. So is it a, with, with, with the kinds of businesses you cover, is it a hard job to decide who to, who to talk to, who to focus on? Yes, there's a lot going on. And so that's the chief difficulty is to decide what to do. And, um, and we have different ways of, of uh, going about that, narrowing it down. Um, Part of it is that I am willing to go out and talk to people, and as I talk to people, I find interesting ideas. And so I'm more likely to find interesting ideas that way than by getting a news release saying, hey, we just, you know, we just turned 30. You know, it's like, well, so what? A lot of, you know, I turned 30, 30 years ago, big deal. Um, so uh, the hard part is to find interesting stories. There's a lot of candidates for stories, but to find the ones that are interesting, that's, that's the hard part. Um, but it's also the fun part. The, what's happening in the Twin Cities these days is that, that the, the younger generation is so entrepreneurial. We devoted an entire issue to it last August, and we'll be doing that next August because it's so much fun. And uh, the, the uh, what do they call them, the millennials, they, they have a different, it's almost like going back to the 60s. They have almost the same attitude as, as the 60s, only instead of thinking government should, should improve the world, they think it's their job as small and mid-sized businesses to improve the world. So they have this social sense combined with their entrepreneurial sense. So it's, it, it, for, for this uh, 
the, for the younger people and, and for a lot of the older ones too because of the recession, the, the idea that money is not an end in itself the way tra traditional capitalism says it. So more and more are saying that, that, that uh, money, rightfully so, is a means to an end. I think that's true. The, the ultimate end is public happiness. You know, how to achieve that? So I think they're, they're fitting into that framework, and so it's very, uh, I'm very optimistic about the future with these young people coming in, wanting to make money, but don't wanting to be, <laughs> to be evil doing it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty good compromise. I did some stuff uh, last uh, summer before last, uh, uh, looking at entrepreneurial enterprises in Austria and agricultural things, and then talking to some people here. And one difference is that generally when someone wants to start a restaurant, let's say in, in Austria, they go to school first. <laughs> well, it's cheap school, it's virtually hmm. free school, why not? But here, there's a tendency to simply <laughs> find a cookbook. <laughs> well, and I'm wondering, you know, how how solid. I mean, how solid the 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 the, the platform for success is with with folks. Uh, I hear these horrible statistics: eighty percent of the for, of startups fail, that kind of thing. How how do you see that? Well, first of all. It, it's risky to enter a startup or to be an entrepreneur and I think what what some of the entrepreneurs have told me is that Minnesota Minnesota nice is actually Minnesota is a very conservative place in a lot of ways that the ideal for most people is to work for a big company and and, and just find your spot and be secure and and you know be predictable and all that stuff so they feel like they have a little bit of a uh, uh, of a contrarian attitude to be an entrepreneur because it is so risk open. It's open to risk rather than being risk averse. Um, as far as how they do it, there's still an awful lot of people going to business school. But uh, there, I, I would say two things. One, the, and the Carlson School here at the university is, is very good at this, and as well as other organizations, is emphasizing activities, doing, you know, okay, you're going to sit in this room all night with these three people and you're going to come up with a business plan tomorrow and, and, and a lot of them actually start these things up. So there's, there's a big emphasis on doing rather than just thinking, even though, like I say, there are a lot of business majors. And another thing is one of the young entrepreneurs I met uh, this last summer uh, was a linguistics major in fact, he completed his PhD, and yet he was one of the entrepreneurial winners uh, of this thing, in which he actually used his linguistics background to figure out a gadget uh, as part of the Internet of Things. Um, if we have time, I'll, I'll tell that story. Or we're Why not? Running out Go of time. ahead. Well, anyway, his, his name is uh, Mohammed Abdurrahman, and uh, his father had a stroke and wasn't able to do things or speak. He wasn't able to use his hands or speak. And so they have devices around now as part of the Internet of Things where you can remotely turn lights on and off, turn TVs off and on, but it revolve, involves having to press a button or to speak into something. And so his father couldn't do either of those things. And so being a linguistics major, well, okay, your language skills have, have uh, uh, kind of been set aside. Well, what did they have before language? Well, they had gestures. So, oh, okay. Well, then he developed a way to use a broad gesture to program a remote device, and so therefore his father could do that. The, the company is called Remo, and they won some big award or something, and were featured in our, our magazine, among many others. But so here's a linguistics major who was able to enter a competition in the business school because they let everybody come in. So it's it, it's true. You don't have to be a business major to, to become an entrepreneur, but you. But then again. Not all business majors would make good entrepreneurs. A lot of them just want to go into the rank and file. So you spend a lot of time thinking about this notion of happiness. Yeah. And it's been a big deal uh, to, to think. I mean, how do you assess the effect of the business community that you attend to on the happiness of, of this community? Uh, are you optimistic there? Well, you know, once again, happiness means a lot of different things. 
And if we take the Aristotelian idea that happiness is like a growing, developing your potential, uh, happiness is an activity, then you would look and, and, and would have to say that the Twin Cities has a pretty good history of businesses making community contributions. Uh, going back, you know, to the Daytons and everybody, you know, uh, 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 voluntarily putting a, a portion of their profits uh, for, for public good and foundations and everything. So that's, that's kind of a strength in our community. In this day and age, though, a lot of the, um, the big corporations don't have CEOs or even board members sometimes that are even from here anymore. So we're, I think we're losing some distance from the, from the big guys that uh, even reporters, you know, ask any reporter, local reporter, and the biggest companies here won't want to talk to them because they'd rather talk to national reporters. They'll talk to the New York Times before they'll talk to the Star Tribune. But uh, I, I think by and large there's a, uh, a, a healthy number of businesses that you hear the phrase giving back. I don't know if I like that phrase or not, but it, it's, it, but it has a good sense in, in, in what they mean by it, and that's that uh, they should share their wealth. They should do something. And, um, and it's always gratifying to see the extent to which people are doing something. They are giving back. They are not putting money as the only thing in their life. Uh, so I, I, and, I, and the more people do it, there's kind of this herd mentality. The more people do it, the more find it acceptable to do it. And especially this young generation. And then even some of the older ones um, uh, are, are coming around to that in reaction to the uh, financial crisis. That Wall Street made a mistake because they put money as the goal rather than the public good and then so what I was doing is just saying that well the, the the standard notion of how they define public good was you know public happiness. Um, Bernie Sanders has made uh, an in, the income gap, the mm -hmm. wealth gap, his main talking point and there's a lot of worry that these entrepreneurial ventures are going to leave an awful lot of people behind. People without the skills, people without any bridge to the skills, the people who are dropping out of high school. So that public happiness is going to be pretty sharply divided in our community. Uh, and, peop and some very angry people are going to be essentially left out. Do you see, do you see hope for, 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 for broad-based public happiness, for African Americans being included in quantity, for bridge, ways out of, uh, of, of, the, of underperforming school systems into the business world, stuff like that? Well, Bernie Sanders is like, uh, well, I mean, we can talk about Karl Marx. I, I think Karl Marx did a very good job of pointing out the problems, but then he had a solution, and that was what gave people trouble. Some people tried it, and it, it didn't really work. But uh, I, I think capitalism has built in problems, and, and now Bernie Sanders is pointing that out. Here we have this, this uh, uh, I, I think it's an unethical extreme of all the wealth going to the top, and all these people, uh, there's a huge, huge underclass. I think it's an ethical problem. Um, but I don't know if, if Bernie Sanders actually has the solution. I mean, uh, uh, having been in government, <laughs> I, I find that I don't always trust it to be the ones to solve all the problems. Um, I, I, I would place my bet with these young entrepreneurs. And, and first of all, entrepreneurs, these young entrepreneurs and even the small and mid-sized companies, they are not the ones that are the, the top tenth of the top one percent. That's a different group. A lot of these people are struggling, and, and uh, when they need a tax break, they really mean it. Uh, all the rules that come by. Uh, the banks in Minnesota, the community banks, are, are disappearing in numbers. We recently ran an article on this because the new rules about the Wall Street banks are so tough. The compliance rules, it's hard for a little small mom and pom bank to, uh, to, to fill out all the compliance stuff. So uh, the, it's the, I think it's the big bad guys. It's almost size, you know, too big to, uh, too big to be ethical, maybe. Um, so there are some problems there, and I, I would place my bet with the uh, 
ethical entrepreneurs and ethical business people more than I would say the government's going to fix it all. But I would say that's where the solution would have to come. Um, for example, um, well, here, here at the university, I was at, a, at an event, a networking event at the Medical Device Center. And uh, this very old man, uh, well, 90 years old, um, well, I don't remember his name, his last name is Dan, but uh, he was a venture capitalist, and, and he had an idea that I think is being followed up and should be followed up more, is that a lot of these base level entrepreneurs, these people that have an idea and that's about it, they have no place to go for money here because Minnesota is a little conservative. They want to wait until you have some sort of track record before they're going to throw money at you. But uh, so here's these people, that, and, and the ones with skills, some of them are leaving town going to where they can get money, you know, especially California or Boston. So his idea was, look, look, at, look at Medtronic. They've got billions, of, they've got cash, they got so much cash, they got to move to Ireland you know, to cover it all. Um, why don't they invest in some startups? You know, because they, you know, they, it would serve their own interests in the long term. And I think, uh, I understand Target is already trying to do this. I'm not sure if General Mills has that idea. But here are these big corporations, they're having trouble growing. They tend to be laying off people more than growing. Why not take some of this largesse that you've accumulated and, and, and spend it growing these, building small businesses that, where the bulk of jobs come from? Anyway, that's what I would say. And do you think your publication is in a position to make that case to the companies? <laughs> you mean if I write an editorial on it? Well, I don't think an editorial. I think an editorial <laughs> policy over a decade or so. Well, the, the, well in, in publication, the editorial policy, uh, you know, ultimately, and here's kind of the, the paradox, is that we're also a business. You know, so I have, I have the owner of the business, and usually, if you take the look at the start to be on the editorial page, they don't have total sway because they have to kind of filter down what the owner thinks, you know, for, for, their, for their editorial voice. So, you know, I, I'm sure I have leeway here. <laughs> I don't know if my boss is watching right now. But, um, I, so in other words, I just can't turn this into a, a, a barnstorming for, for uh, income equality. But, uh, I think a more indirect way to do it is to is to encourage these young entrepreneurs and small and mid-sized businesses, encourage the ones that are doing good things. In fact, our, our next award ceremony coming up uh, this winter is called the Community Impact Awards. And there you have a system set up to honor and give praise and positive reinforcement to businesses that are doing good things for the community. So I think that's kind of the way to go, you know, the sugar rather than a stick. Well, yeah. But I'm interested, I mean, I mean that leads, leads into a nice sort of valedictory question. I mean, your, your ability to beat a drum is going to be proportional to how little you want us to, to be in the job next year. <laughs> you know, you, well, can, you can beat a pretty loud drum on, in your last six months. <laughs> well, the, the purpose of the magazine is not to cause social change. Uh -huh. The purpose of the magazine is stated on our cover, uh, Inspiration for Growing Companies. Uh -huh. So I think that's a good end in itself. So that's my purpose I at the see. magazine, and to do that in a way that uh, that it, my particular spin on it is to do it in a way that fosters community. Uh -huh. That's why I go out and meet with people, I visit factories, and I'm going to be visiting more. I see. I just like to. I, li I think the more people are connected, socially connected at a personal level, the better. So basically. You're pretty. You're easy with the role that you've you've grown into. <laughs> well, yes, I would say this is the first job I've had that I actually qualified for when I got it. Yeah. I knew how to run a magazine. I knew how to do business stuff. So, and we basically do features, which is something I've been doing a lot all my life. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it.